are so excited to have Terry and Donna with us this morning. I told Sam, we both expressed the same thing, Terry. It's like we've had this nervous energy, like mom and dad are coming <laughs> to check on the work. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but you guys, you, you really are. I hope you both know that. I've expressed that to you, Terry, but Donna, to you too. You are a spiritual mother and father to us, and we are honored to have you guys with us. I mean that from the bottom of my heart, and honestly, we, we both said that we could stand up here and gush for about a half an hour and make you uncomfortable. We, that's not the intent. But you truly have fathered us individually. We would not be where we are with the Lord if it had not been for both of you guys contending for us. And certainly, as far as this work goes, it, it wouldn't be a thing if it weren't for you. And your willingness to endure the difficulties, the hits that you guys have endured. So thank you from the bottom of our heart. And that you would do it in a time where you are presently enduring something. Thank you so much. It's an honor for us. And I, I'm going to have Sam later on uh, is going to pray for you, Terry, when, when you come up and share, and he may want to say some other, other things, gush a little bit more. But um, I wanted to just real quickly, before I jump into prayer this morning, I wanted to reiterate some things. You guys have probably learned this with me. I'm, I'm nothing if not repetitious because I find that the Lord has to be repetitious with me. And I feel a couple of things about that. Number one, it's an indication that I'm not listening when the Lord has to repeat himself. Um, but I also find that the more we hear something, we're countering a message that's not the testimony of the Lord um, in the house of the Lord. And so, you know, it, it, there's, there's great value in hitting this over and over. But I wanted to share what I've shared with you guys. I think I shared this publicly Two weeks ago, I know I shared it in prayer. Sam and I have both felt from the Lord that we're in a obviously a very formative stage here at Narrow Way, but we feel like there's been a little bit of a transition, and it's related to Acts 2.42, and I wanted to just read this scripture again. We both saw in this a progression of the Lord. And I'll tell you where we're at after I read it. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, which is not just sharing a meal together. It's sitting at the, at the Lord's table. It's eating of communion rightly in the Spirit, not just outwardly, and the prayers. And, I, and we've seen that there's a progression in this. So we first have to be aligned with the right apostolic teaching that's not Sam the Apostle or Ben the Apostle or Terry the Apostle. That's the Lord as the Apostle, firstly, who gave us the right teaching in the original 12, including Paul, right? So it's alignment with the eternal gospel, which we can all say we've, there's been a measure of the Lord putting us rightly on that foundation. But here's what the Lord showed me in this, because we have to move on from just sitting under the apostles' teaching. If it doesn't move on to fellowship, we have an, an issue. And the Lord gave me this warning specifically to narrow way, but I believe it applies in a larger sense to the church in our day. He said the way is littered with congregations that stalled out between devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and moving on to fellowship. And he gave me his proof of that. I'll show you this in 1 John 1. John is writing to the church, and he says this. I love this. I always just assumed he was writing to unbelievers, but he's writing to the church. He says, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And who is us? I believe he's talking about the apostolic. They had partaken in a measure of fellowship with the Lord, and had come into an outward fellowship with each other that was otherworldly. And we've said this over and over in our gatherings, you guys, and I'm saying this because I'm going to hit this in prayer, but it's important for us lest we don't heed the warning of the Holy Spirit in this. Our fellowship is not first outwardly. If it is, it's just soulish. Our fellowship with each other is to the degree that we have come into Christ. And so the fellowship that the... That the 
whatever that number was, whether it's 12 or more than that, I happen to believe it was much more than that. It was beyond just the, the, the 12 apostles. There was a corporate fellowship that existed in that early leadership because they had come into Christ and had partaken of the heavenly fellowship that was being offered to them. And John is pushing on something in the church, as was Paul, that, guys, if you don't come into this fellowship, all this is to no avail. All of the teaching, all of our contending, all of the hits that we've taken, it's to no avail. There's no other purpose, guys, for us to exist than that we come into the fellowship that the Lord is offering us, which I'm convinced, and I'm praying this for us, the Lord has had me in a place where He's had me asking for a revelation of the fellowship that exists within the Godhead. I don't think we have the first clue about these three persons of the Godhead and the love that they have for one another and the life that they share, each one selflessly laying down himself on behalf of the other two in communion. And that's a beautiful thing. And I believe that the Lord would give us a revelation of that so that we could come and take our place. The Lord's been talking to me about this. Come and take your place at the table. He's talking about the fellowship of the Godhead. Now, that doesn't in any way indicate that I have any right to sit there than other, by, other than the blood of Jesus. It doesn't mean It's not saying anything about me. It says everything about the grace of God to want to include me in that fellowship in the Son. It's the only way. But John is pushing on this with the early church. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And if you go back to Acts 2.42, where the Lord is going with this, and we're not unique in this, but we are certainly on the Lord's heart in this way. It's a call to the church to whosoever will respond. But if we will be willing to leave, I'll put it like this, what by and large to us still is just outward, and go inward with the Lord and partake of Him as life, Learn to engage in Him in true fellowship, which, Victor, goes way beyond quiet time. We were talking about that earlier this week. I love my times alone with the Lord. I love my quiet time. But I can have a quiet time and miss fellowship. In the same way, I can have fellowship when I'm at work or doing something else. Fellowship is internal, and it's meant to be eternal, unbroken. It's the praying without ceasing that Paul was talking about. But here's the beauty in all this, to encourage you. And I believe there's a huge contention to move from the apostles' teaching to true fellowship. Once we hit true fellowship with the Lord, then we can rightly come and sit at the Lord's table and partake of Him in a way that is in keeping with 1 Corinthians 11. It's not partaking in an unworthy manner. It's partaking from a point, a standpoint of the Lord has dealt with me in a measure that Christ has become my life. I'm not partaking with self as the motivation. That is, and and guys, as we go there, the Lord will have a fellowship outwardly that is akin to Psalm 133. How precious it is when brothers dwell in unity. You know, we used to quote that back in the 90s, and the focus was unity in the church, but it was unity for the sake of unity, and it was all soulish unity. But the Lord would have us sit at the table to partake of Him so that we can enjoy communion with each other, and it will be like the oil being poured on the head of Aaron, running down the beard. And that's a place, Psalm 133 says, of commanded blessing. And again, we were taught the wrong things back in the 90s that if we could just have unity, then whatever we ask for or command, it will happen. That's from a self-centered viewpoint. But when the Lord has purged us and dealt with flesh, then it's the Lord's intent and purpose that's coming through His body that is operating in true communion, true fellowship with one another, and whatever they say will be done because it will be the will of the Lord. That's taking our warfare to a whole other level. That's end-of-the-ages type warfare, you guys. That's the accuser of the brethren being cast down to the earth. Then we will be the house of prayer that the Lord intended for us to be. 
So that's the progression in all of this. But the trap is to get religious and to think that we have become something or that we are something because we're under the right teaching. And so I want to pray. The Lord gave me Hebrews 12 this morning as a launching point for prayer. And I just want to read the last part of Hebrews 12, and I'm going to pray into this. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. And I think it's interesting, why was the Lord talking about a root of bitterness in this passage? If you connect this passage to Acts 2.42, and that's the progression, that that's what He's after, why would He warn us against a root of bitterness coming up? And it's because of what we shared a couple weeks back, because the progress in this, the way of the Lord, the process of the Lord, is suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And we tied hope back to, again, just Colossians 1. The hope of glory is Christ in us. So Romans 5 then is suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. And character produces Christ in us. As a matter of fact, character is not our character. That word character is proven character. Who gets proven in the midst of a trial. If you think it's you, you haven't been broken. It's the Lord who gets proven. We get exposed in a trial. There's no other way in this, you guys. I told Sam I'd love to stop hammering on this issue of suffering, but there's no, it is the process of the Lord. It is the only way that Christ is going to be formed in us. So see to it then in the process and enduring the process of the of the Lord, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Lord, forgive us for refusing you, the only one in all of existence that has any right to speak anything of any value. Forgive us for listening to the wrong voices and for coming to something that can be touched. We confess to you, Lord, with all that we have been taught and all that we've journeyed by the Spirit in the Lord, we still have desires in our soul to cling to what can be touched, what can be seen, what can be measured outwardly. Lord, would you purge that from our flesh? Would you march us through whatever corrective hardships we must endure so that we might be set on solid ground and we might get off that shaky ground? We've been offered a seat at the fellowship table, the fellowship of the Godhead. And forgive us for not valuing that, Lord. Forgive us for thinking that it's something quite other than what it truly is. I ask, Lord, that you would rewire us. We were talking about this earlier this morning 
in a different context, Terry and I were, about the, the need for rewiring, even in this city. And I recognize that, and I'm for that. And I say yes and amen, Lord, that you would rewire this city in the way that you desire with specific individuals. We say yes to the rewiring that must take place. But, Lord, we would be fools if we didn't acknowledge our own need to be rewired. There's still too much of the old operating in us, too much of the old covenant mentality where we're drawn to types and shadows, Lord, and we're trying to recreate things according to our soulish understanding of the Scriptures and our own strength. But when you called us here to build, Lord, you drove this point home clearly to us. That Sam and I were not, just as Zerubbabel was not, to build according to human understanding or the strength of man or the wisdom of man. What, can, what is meant to be built here can only be built by the Spirit. And we acknowledge that, Lord, and that's not just in an outward way. It is with this group. You are establishing something that is foundational with this people. And I'm grateful, Lord, just in the same way that I'm thankful for the process that's unfolding with my own house, Lord. And I, I don't even see delay as being a tactic of the enemy with my house. I just see it as you're preparing me in the process, teaching me in the process. And you're making sure that even in the building of my natural house, everything is done in right order. and No step is missed. And that when it's built, it's built precisely. And I thank you. I can trust you in that. But Lord, if you care about my dwelling, which will one day be destroyed by fire, how much more do you care about the house of God? How much more so are you meticulously building here in a way that is in keeping with your wisdom? We give you the right to take as long as you need to build the right way foundationally what needs to be built in us, Lord, so that when you go public with this thing and connect us to others that you would bring into this work, Lord, there's not an integrity issue going on within us. That we are not built in such a way as to be haphazardly thrown together with no structural integrity so that the whole thing collapses when others... I have no interest in that, and nor does Sam, nor do you. Rewire us, Lord. Get our eyes off the temporal. Get our eyes off of that which the soul is drawn to, and may we with wisdom submit to the processes of the Lord through which you are rewiring us and offering us your Son as life. Deal with the addictions of our flesh, Lord, and cut them off. Shake what needs to be shaken. Shake what can be shaken, Lord. I ask that you guard our hearts against a root of bitterness. Lord, I, we were talking about this earlier too. I, I don't like that we feel like we have to qualify everything. Why can't we just speak the truth and let the truth speak for itself, Lord? And yet we're so childish in our understanding that when we talk about suffering and hardship, it kind of feels like we have to qualify and say, oh, you know, it's not the way that the Lord desires, but it's just He's dealing with stubborn people. Lord, it is the way, and there's no other way. Can we just be mature about that and expect that we don't learn? I could testify, Lord. I could point to example after example in my own life. We just do not learn in times of peace and prosperity. We don't learn in times of comfort and ease. I don't know a single athlete that didn't have to be pushed beyond what he thought he was capable of in the natural in order to achieve a higher level of performance athletically, Lord, and why would it be any different in the spirit? We have to be broken of the limitations of our own flesh so that we can be laid hold of by another than life. And that brokenness process is never pleasant. It is what it is. Can we just man up and endure it and not be bitter? 
and not be thrown into confusion every time you shake what needs to be shaken. Can we just respond with trust and entrust ourselves to you? May we not resist, Lord, as Jacob did. I'm convinced that that all-night wrestling match didn't have to be an all-night wrestling match. It could have ended much quicker. May it be so in us, Lord, that when you pin us down, we humble ourselves and submit to you. Lord, you don't do this. Again, I, I'm not qualifying anything. It just is what it is. Hardships that you put us through, the shakings. You don't put us through that unnecessarily. You don't put us through that just to prove a point. You don't put us through that because you're just trying to show us who's boss. That's not it at all. You're such a, an amazing, tender-hearted, loving Father. And that which you have prepared for us, Lord, Paul was clear, eye hasn't seen it, ear hasn't heard, neither has entered into the heart. We can't even comprehend the beauty and the fullness and the richness of coming to this table and eating of you. But I am so stubborn and so insistent on my own way. We are. Thank you for patiently enduring all the nonsense of our flesh. Thank you for being faithful and committed to bringing us to our end that we might find you as life, Jesus. May we with wisdom humble ourselves in real time as you resist the flesh. May it not be that we have to come all the way through a season of hardship and then pray and get the word of the Lord and find out what that season was all about way back when, when we failed to respond to you. But may we, may we respond to you in real time. Humility. In desperation for you, Lord. You deserve to have the house of prayer you envision here in Clarksville. And that's why we're here. That's why we've been engaged in the warfare that we've been in. That's why Terry's taken some of the hits I believe he's taken recently. It's specifically related to what you would do here in Clarksville, Lord, and we are contending for that, and we recognize we're up against a religious principality, Lord, that would cause us to become stuck and fixated on the outward, and we say, no, Lord, may it not be that we fail to move on to become the house of prayer that you have envisioned. You died to secure it, Lord, and we come into agreement with that which you died to secure May it be so in us. May we be joined together as living stones, as a testimony to Christ, the eternal one. I ask that you break confusion off of our minds, Lord, that have been a poison to us, that have kept us from moving on. I ask, Lord, that you would restrain this thing that it no longer be allowed to bring a distortion to the message, Lord, because we can take this message. We talked about it earlier this morning, Sam and I did, that this message is quite appealing if distorted in just the right way. It's quite appealing to a certain type of religious flesh. And I ask, Lord, that it would come forth with clarity and that the enemy not be allowed to distort and twist. I pray that it pierce our hearts, dividing soul and spirit bypassing our minds where it needs to and go right to the heart of the matter. Bring revelation as to who you are and what you're after and what you would establish here in this city, what you would establish in us. Give us ears to hear, Lord. In fact, consecrate our ears that we might hear you and you alone recognizing instantly all other voices and not giving our ear to them. Pierce us.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you for protecting, Lord. I feel it. I feel the grace of the Lord on this work, and I'm so grateful, Lord, but that doesn't in any way excuse our responsibility as leaders. It doesn't excuse our responsibility as those who are part of this work in any other capacity to respond to you, Lord. But I thank you for your undying commitment for the grace of the Lord in the person of the Lord Jesus to protect what you've planted in this place. Without that, Lord, we are, we're doomed. We recognize it. But with the Lord as our fortress, with the Lord as our shield, I am excited to see what you're going to bring forth. I know at some point this thing will go outward, but Lord, may we not push that. May we not get ahead of you. May we be content just to let you establish the foundation so that when you do, Lord, it'll be a beautiful thing to see how you move outwardly. And I don't put any qualifications on that or restrictions on that. I don't know what outward means. I don't know what numbers aren't even important. I don't care if it's one person in this city that will respond. I just believe there is a harvest here that is beyond this group. And we will, I, I, I believe you've made a promise to me, Lord. We will see the capstone brought out to this work with shouts of grace, grace to it. And it's not a Babylonian work. It'll look quite different to the world than it looks to those who have eyes to see. Because it's a kingdom work. Lord, unless we're born again, we can't see what it is that you're building. I thank you for it. I thank you. It is a privilege and an honor just to be a part of it, Lord. It is a privilege and an honor just to be able to, in some small measure, be a part of the building of the house of God. We thank you, Lord. You didn't have to include us. That's the, that's the beauty of of your character, your nature, your way with us, your love for us. Lord, you could build this thing on your own without our help. You don't need our help. And yet, in love, you include us. And as a father longing to bring maturity to his sons, you teach us, you deal with our flesh, you fill us with the Son, thus transforming us, all for the sake of fellowship. I love you, Lord. You're so beautiful. Terry, you want to come on up? And Sam, if you want to come up, we'll pray for Terry. It's an honor for us, Lord. It's just an honor for us to be able to welcome our friend, our brother. Uh, it's our honor. Truly. Spiritual father. It's truly a power on him. I told Ben earlier that um, whenever dad and mom come around, you want to start hiding the leaven. <laughs> Quick, hide it. <laughs> um, no, I mean that in a good sense because uh, Terry's just been a very faithful friend and father, mm -hmm. spiritual father to both of us and to encourage us to go after the Lord wholeheartedly. And um, First Thessalonians 5, I just wanted to read a, a little bit of that. It says... Um, It says, First uh, Thessalonians five twelve. Uh, but we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you, 
and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that, you're esteem, that you esteem them very highly in love because, because of their work. Live in peace with one another. And then it goes on to a lot of other good stuff. But, um, you know, I there's a real place to honor spiritual fathers and mothers. And you guys are that to me and to Ben and to our families. I had a just little thing I was going to read so for the sake of time because I would go way over time if I started flowing with my soul. Um, <laughs> but I'm just going to read it. So it's on the record, but it says, Terry, um, I felt the Lord give this to me. Terry, you are, and Terry is a faithful man of God, a man of true character and a true example of Christ to so many and a dear friend and spiritual father. Not only that, he's a true apostle and prophet of the Lord with a clear call on <coughs> of the Lord on his life, manifesting the gift of Christ. It's a uni- I mean to say that uniquely, manifesting the gift of Christ and operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There's a distinction there. It's a gift to us to have a man of God in our house, in our homes, in our fellowship that we get to uh, receive from. So I'll skip ahead. Uh, basically, if you receive... A prophet, you receive a a true prophet, a prophet's reward. If that prophet has received the gift of Christ, then through them you receive Christ. But it's as we believe in the Lord. Later in that, that Thessalonians passage, it says, don't despise prophetic utterances or prophetic gifts, but test all things. And as we do that, and we get to receive from the Lord through vessels of the Lord, that has been misused and abused in the history of the church, but it, the shadow does not negate the sun, right? The sun's actually greater than the shadow. So let's keep that in mind. If we receive the message then we, and put it into practice, meaning we earnestly say yes and apply it in our lives, then we receive the gift of Christ through that vessel. For seven years, I've also witnessed Donna faithfully love and serve the Lord, her husband, her children, and grandchildren. She's a faithful woman of God who prays fervently and consistently for the Lord's perfect will for his people. She loves well and is poured out so much for the sake of the increase of Christ and others. The Lord in her is a force to be reckoned with. I wouldn't mess with it. (laughs) And I receive the Lord in you, Donna, and honor you before him. (laughs) So anyways, that's my that's my little gush session. I said I bear my body to Marx as I tried to (laughs) bear my body. (laughs) Exactly. So anyways, that's that's what I felt the Lord have me give. But I'll just pray for you and. We'll let you go. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Well, Father, I thank you so much for Terry. I thank you for your spirit, Lord, that you are securing and sealing a vessel of honor, Lord, a vessel of life, a bridal vessel in this hour, Lord, that you desire. You're doing it in us and you're doing it in others. We ask you to increase, to remove the hindrances, Lord. We ask you to open up our eyes spiritually and our ears spiritually to hear and and see what the Spirit is saying and to receive you, Lord, through Terry, Lord, this morning and Donna. Thank you for what you're doing in this body. I ask you to increase, Lord. I ask for your grace, Lord, to fill us through and through that we would continue to come to the table. We wouldn't shrink back, but we'd press on, Lord by your work of the Holy Spirit in us. In Jesus' name. And Lord, I ask for healing. Yes, Lord. Body by the blood of the Lamb. Yes. I, I, I believe this is you, Lord, that you would arise as healer. I recognize, as does Terry and Sam and everybody else in this room, that there comes a time for enduring the hits of the enemy so that others can 
come out to you. Sam and I both have talked about it. We're here directly because of this man's willingness to take hits on our behalf. So I recognize that, but I also recognize that you establish limitations for those hits. Yes. And I believe you are arising, Lord, to establish clear boundaries. This ends now. Yes. May his body be completely healed and the pain gone and the swelling gone and even the outward effects of this, the whatever, bumps, scars, whatever, may they be completely dealt with by the blood of the lambs. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, God. Yeah, love, the water down there. yeah thank you. Love you guys. Well, thank you. That was uh, unexpected. And truly, Don and I appreciate y'all's kindness, guys, and all of you. So it's our joy. Um, yeah, that's right. We don't get that in Van Leer, do we? <laughs> Is it your car? Pay no attention to the guy running around out there trying to get in your car. <laughs> well, let me pray one more time. I just wanted to pray. Uh, you know, it's each time um, we corporately or individually are with the Lord, there's always this divine um, initiative and our opportunity to have an increase of Christ. That's what I want, don't you? An increase of the Lord. And so, Lord, as we're together and with you, may there be an increase of Jesus Christ within each and all of us, each of us individually, but also, Lord, with this corporate group of people here in this city, Lord, your increase of life and light as the truth as it is in Jesus, who is the life and light and way, Lord, you would increase today specifically, Lord, that I, we would have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. And that, Lord, uh, being able to hear what your voice is clearly saying to us and that being corporate, that being larger, Lord, than this city and larger than our nation, we would have ears to hear. Let all confusion just be right, right now by your Spirit put away from us. That, oh Lord, there would be a clarity. There would be living understanding. That, Lord, we see your wisdom at work in and among us. We see your wisdom in the processes that, Lord, you are leading us through, even when it's the valley of the shadow of death. What are you teaching us but to fear no evil? I thank you, Lord, that we can trust you. We can trust you in and through, and I mean it that way, Lord, in and through to the end, every process. That, Lord, it absolutely is for our benefit spiritually for your increase in us and among us. So wisdom, Lord, wisdom today to understand your ways, to understand how you achieve your goals, as Ben was saying earlier. Lord, that it's not a mystery in the Bible as to how you work, how you've worked in the past and how you're going to work now. It's, you're consistent. You're not uh, a different God with a different intention. So we worship you today for that fact. We know, Lord, that we can trust you. It's been proven already, but you're going to prove it even to greater lengths, heights, and depths. And so we bless you. Amen. Well, amen. So um, I'm going to look first at Revelation 19 this morning, and then we got a lot of scriptures to look at, and, and um, don't know if I can get to all of them, but I'll get to as many as I can. I, 
I didn't want to share something. I, I said a little bit of this to Ben this morning, um, if it's okay to, to share this, what I saw. A couple of visionary type experiences concerning what the Lord is doing behind the scenes, unseen by us in the city of Clarksville. So one of them, it was kind of a unique way that he, he showed it in the vision. Uh, the Lord from you guys, let's say it this way, from you people, was taking new wire uh, and stringing it to various homes throughout the area. But it was in the process of running the wire. The Lord was like, because they've got to have new wiring <laughs> if they're ever going to be able to hear what's being said. And so the Lord is, was clearly in this working with these homes where he was taking the wiring. The wiring wasn't at the homes yet. It was getting to the homes, and that was the process. But the Lord was very clear. He's like, once I connect the wiring to the homes, that whole connect thing, then uh, you're going to see not just what we want to see mostly in internal spiritual growth to the image of Christ, but we will see that in greater numbers of people here. It's only a matter of time. But the process of rewiring and taking new wire Let's just set this way. To anyone who's been in church any length of time, how many can say with me, God's been rewiring me, <laughs> going back and still is? It's a wonderful thing. So um, for people to be able to have ears to hear what the Lord is saying through you guys, what he's demonstrating through you guys, what he's living through you guys, to have eyes to see that. The next vision was tying into that. It was like... Um, simple vision of one of the lights like at an airport it has the green on one side and the white and it turns and the Lord told me he said the problem is Terry he said that people are colorblind and can't see the green light which re represents life <laughs> y'all know that most people are colorblind when it comes to that in reality I mean seriously this is a fact most people to the green light at an airport when it's circling, they can't tell the difference between the white and the green. They think it's all white. Well, males are the worst. Yeah. It's in the, in the male has the worst problem with it. I remember a friend years ago, one of my good friends, Chuck, we were, we lived across from the Dixon airport at that time. And so Chuck was talking about all these benefits he was getting from going to this one chiropractor and adjustments. And he said, I even, I've lost a lot of my color blindness, he says. So he's looking at the light. See, Terry, green, white, and it was the exact opposite. <laughs> Honestly, Renee, I didn't have the heart to tell him. But his wife, Joanne, was standing right there. <laughs> she had the heart. I said, no, Chuck. <laughs> So it's, uh, I get it, I get the Lord's imagery with that light. I mean, people may can see light, but life is where God's wanting this to go to, right? It's the life. He came that we might have life. You know, and that life is the light. So anyway, I, I recognize thus there will be those who are not colorblind. And they can tell life. They can hear, they can, let's just say, the senses the five senses are attuned to the distinction between life, <laughs> death, stagnation, tradition, right? So anyway, just that I felt the Lord wanted to encourage you guys of his behind the scenes hidden work at family level because he was showing it to me in homes. So at family levels, what the Lord is preparing and doing his work by his spirit in people that we I don't know that y'all know them. So, but anyway, God has his ways, right? So, all right, guys. So, uh, Revelation 19, again, I'm going to be in several passages. But here in Revelation 19, I just want to <clears throat> hit specifically, <clears throat> I'm not going to read the whole chapter. Uh, but starting with verse nine, verse chapter 19, verse number 1. After these things I heard, as it were, a loud voice of great multitude. So notice, I just want to point this out. Notice the sequentialness of this passage. After these things. That's a time. After what things? 
18 from chapter 1 to chapter 18, what we would call it. It's after these things that what we're about to read occurs, right? Just want to point that out. It's not that you can't read it and see that. I'm just wanting to point out what we're looking at, okay, as we're looking at it. After these things, I heard, as it were, a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous. uh, For he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. So notice uh, there is a wrath directed directly at uh, what we would call Babylon. The system of Babylon, not just the city, but I believe it's the system, it's economic system, it's governmental system, it's religious system the beast system, which is Babylonian, um, God's specific judgment or wrath is brought upon it. This is not a wrath, a generally speaking. It's the wrath of God specific to this beast kingdom and Babylon. Anyway, just trying to be clear. <laughs> And a second time, they said hallelujah. So the heaven is rejoicing at God's judgment upon this Babylonian system, wherever it is. But it is going to have the combination of Babylon. I want to make a distinction. There can be Babylonian, an economic Babylonian system. And there is. And it's with us right now. There is a, uh, though, however... To have a complete Babylon as the enemy wants to have, it entails government and it entails religion. The threefoldness, economics, government, and religion. Gabriel told me in 2001 in that encounter uh, that spread out over four days that uh, there would be um, this combination of economics, government, and religion And there's multiple meanings to this, you know, 666 dynamic. But one of them is the number of man demonically energized in economy, government, and religion combined into one system. Gabriel said that directly to me, that it would be the case. And so the the scriptures show it as the case. Where that is the case, though, that won't be worldwide. Satan will never have a kingdom that covers this entire earth. Not ever. He hasn't in the past, and he won't in the future. So it'll be very limited. In fact, when you read Daniel chapter 2, and you read what it says there about the ten toes, the feet and the ten toes, it's made out of iron and clay. And when you read what it says there, the iron and clay, what it represents, it's not just that it's brittle. It's that they can't get along. You go read it. (laughs) It's not going to stay united. That system will be easily broken, just like clay. Iron and clay don't adhere. That's the point. So realize, we realize something here that what is upon us and what's already around us actually will not stay united. It's going to split. It's going to fracture. There's going to be factions. And what was with the... The beast at first will be against the beast. So that's all in the book of Daniel, right? It's very clear. Satan's not going to have this uh, united front long term. He may have it as long as the economy is giving people what they want, right? But that won't last. And, you know, we all know this, guys. People are fickle. And when they're not getting what they want, what do they do? Well, we know what they do because we're people. <laughs> you know, so so uh, I'm simply saying, when you don't have the Lord inwardly and in righteousness and that life, there's no unity that can last. Anyway, that's maybe not here nor there, but I want to make a point. 
God is specifically here judging Babylon. He just got he just finished it, chapter 17 and 18. So heaven's rejoicing over that fact at the fall and the end forever of Babylon. Once it's done here, it's done. There's nothing ever going to be like it again, which is beautiful in and of itself, isn't it? So, so they're rejoicing. The 24 elders and the four living creatures, verse 4, fell down, worshiped God who sits on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. So hallelujah is used three times here in a few short verses. Um, and a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bond servants, you who fear him, the small and the great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of the great multitude, and as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty peals of thunders. We don't want to get into all this, but the, the, the seven thunders, the meaning of that is bound to this passage as well. But anyway, without getting into all that. Again, hallelujah for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Now I want us to look at sequential timing. It started after these things. Here in the first part of the what we call chapter 18 or chapter 19. Now it is the time for the marriage supper. It hasn't been. But after these things, it is. So let's just look sequentially is my point. <clears throat> the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride, there it is, has made herself ready. Now I want to point out something very simple. If there's a rapture pre or mid, why didn't the bride go? Because the bride doesn't come until the Lord returns. So who went in the rapture? <laughs> Wasn't the bride, because she's here. Right? Y'all see what I'm pointing to here? Is anybody, let's just say it this way. If there's a rapture, the bride would be raptured. She's the most ready vessel there's ever been in the history of the earth. And made herself ready, right? And yet, she's right here. The following verses is the coming of the Lord. Not that y'all are believing in the rapture, pre or mid. All of it's a joke. <laughs> be honest with you. It's not, we shouldn't be confused. It's black and white right here. The bride makes herself ready, that's when the Lord returns, right? And that is the scripture. And it's not only here, it's in other places as well, such as Isaiah 60. The glory of the Lord, deep darkness shall cover the nations. Deep, deep darkness will be on the nations, but the glory of the Lord will rise in you. What's that saying? Same thing this is saying. In the deepest of darknesses, the glory of the Lord is going to be in his people. They're not A-W-O-L, <laughs> don't you think? In fact, when you see, and this is what I want to take us to, the wisdom of God in this kind of a process in order to make the bride ready. The wisdom of God is bring her through this time frame and let God, um, let's say, test and bring approval to that vessel. That is the way of God, right? Hello? And we'll look at some more scriptures that are pointing to that, but I just want us to see it. So the bride is not ready early in the book of, Tri of, the, the, of the book of Revelation. She's made ready by the tribulation and the dealings of God with her. Now that is consistent with James. It's consistent with Romans. It's consistent with so many scriptures as to how God prepares an individual or a group of people. There is, please hear what I'm about to say, there is no different process. He will go to that process every single time. And the results can only be the results by us going through the processes. 
There cannot be the results God intends without that process. That should be comforting, right? Because, guys, when we're going through difficulties, and, and, and if I've raised, had you raise your hands, who's been through difficulties in the last umpteen years, we we wouldn't have enough limbs to get up in the air. <laughs> right? We'd be borrowing a few extra hands, feet, whatever. Uh, the fact is that the kindness and grace of God is seen in his making us ready. More so than his protecting us. But that's a rewiring, don't you think? Because, you know, if the mindset is protect me, protect me, protect me, rather than make me ready, we're completely at odds with the mind of the Holy Spirit, the commitment of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, right? As well as the, the triune God, the rest of the triune God. So I mean this to encourage us, guys. There's no way the end can come without the bride ready. And there's no way the bride's ready without the tribulation. No way. Let me ask you, who's worth being raptured right now? That's a good question, don't you think, Mel? Is there a vessel, a remnant vessel worldwide that's ready in this divine moment? Could it be a divine moment and it be ready? If that were true, then we would be here in Revelation 19. But we're not. We're going to be, we're just not yet. So what are you saying, Terry? I'm saying we're at the beginning of the process, so to speak. We're not at the end of it yet. And readiness, again, who's getting raptured? Because there's no one going up until they're ready. <laughs> right? That's just, when you say common sense, Mel, just it's biblical common sense. Common sense biblically wise is no one's going up to meet the Lord until they're ready. Because he's not coming until they're ready. Because it's about a marriage. Right here in this scripture says that, right? So um, I just spent a little bit of time on this just to see the fact of it. We'll step back here up and look at the principle behind it. The principle behind it is what's so beautiful. When you, let me say it this way, and, and think with me for a moment when you say this. What's been hidden from us for so long is the ways of God. And what I'm speaking about here is his ways. And they're not random either. How God makes a single person ready. You can look at that in the the scriptures. You can see his attempts at it in a corporate vessel with Israel that wouldn't go with him fully. Uh, and his, let's say it this way, the fight to have a bride ready has been now a 2,000 year long process. You know, with there's been bridal people through that process, but not the final vessel, which we're meant now to be. There will have never been on the earth a vessel quite like the bridal vessel that will be on the earth in this time. The fact of readiness and then the fact of the numbers of the remnant being a full measured number. So I want to, that's a cause for hallelujah and rejoice if we see it rightly. Right? Uh, God, let me just say one more word of encouragement. God is determined, I want to be equally determined with him, that we not stand before him and him not be able to say well done. Because the bride's going to get that directly. Well done. Now, you look at the kindness of God in this, there's a hallelujah. Don't you think, guys? There's a hallelujah in this. Thank you, Lord. Don't let me, I'll say it this way, stand before you, not ready, because I know what's going to follow. There's go I'm going to suffer loss. There's no doubt in my mind about it. But if I allow him to make me ready, and he's after more than that, he's after corporate. If we allow this, guys, 
the bride will be made ready and there will be nothing but to the overcomers I do this I do this and that's a sign that the overcomer Zion the bride all speaking of a single vessel quite beautiful the ways of God just not human <laughs> don't you think I can say they're beautiful. Are they difficult? Well, process can be difficult. So, uh, but if we're encouraged in the process and realize it's be, we're going through this process because the Lord is in us. The Lord is with, the Lord is among us. We are made to suffer because of the Lord. Right? So it's, it's important to have the right mathematical equation if the mathematical equation is, what have I done to deserve this? That's the wrong mathematical equation. The equation is God is committed and faithful to us to make us ready. And these processes are about that. The devil has his things, but God has his purpose. And the devil has to operate within God's boundaries when it comes to us. He does not have a free hand. He can be a tool used by God, but that's it. He does not have, you know, I'm going to do whatever I want to to whoever I want to. He does not have that liberty. <laughs> right? Not when it comes to God's children. So anyway, I hope you find this a little bit of encouragement, maybe a little small pinky full of encouragement to your heart, that God's purpose in this, and it's unique in the numbers, because we're looking at the final numbers in this, let's say it this way, in this time frame of a bride that's made ready by tribulation. And so um, her reward in the Lord is the greatest reward of any people who've ever lived on the earth, equal to those in the past who were bridal, but those were few in number. But she is the most... Uh, useful vessel the Lord's ever had on this planet beyond his own son. That's what it means to be made ready. That's all I'm pointing to. So we'll see that. But anyway, it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen. So this is, again, we're looking at sequence, right, Melanie? We're looking at a sequence here. She's handed these because of a victory, an overcoming dynamic, then she's given this. To clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And he said to me, right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So not everyone is. Right? And he said to me, these are true words of God. <clears throat> and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said, do not do that. I am a fellow servant. This is a human that's talking to, more than likely, Daniel. Why would I say that? Because I have a little bit of insight into it. That's why I would say it. Daniel got the revelation that he got revelation directly from God and Gabriel. Gabriel had to help him interpret it and give him understanding of it, right? And so God, I believe, is using Daniel here, at least one, at least some of the time, Daniel, not Daniel all of the time, but there's other humans involved in this. But Daniel, I believe, is one of them. He said to me, do not do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold to the testimony of Jesus. That's a human, right? Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So this is all the readying. The bride has made herself ready. She's now been clothed with fine linen, which is the righteous acts of the saints. Hers is an invitation to the marriage supper. See the sequence? Readiness followed by fine linen, followed by, that's, that's a wedding garment basically, as well. And then the marriage supper. 
And so he falls to worship, and uh, the man talking to him, whoever it is, whether it's Daniel or not, it doesn't matter. But whoever this man is talking to him, tells him, don't do that. And then verse 11, and I saw heaven open, and a white horse, and he who sat upon it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. And so here's the return of the Lord, but only after the bride has been made ready and has made herself ready. That's actually how it says it. It's important that it be uh, has made herself ready because it requires of us, right? And there is a requirement on several levels, but one of the main requirements is that we be with the Lord in the process, right? It's going to be a work of his spirit, but it takes me being complicit, me being willing, right? All of us. So, all right. So let's then... Uh, we, we pointed at that. Now I want to look at a number of scriptures, um, starting with uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. So I'm going to just look at processes here. But while you're turning to 2 Peter, so James in um, <clears throat> chapter 1 says something that, again, is, I think, very helpful for us to understand processes and uh, we may look again at Romans 5 as well, uh, Ben, just to, but in James chapter 1, uh, he says in verse 12, blessed is the man, notice this, guys, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. So holding up, believing, resisting the enemy, believing in God, entrusting ourselves to the Lord, persevering no matter how long it is how many can say with me well that's a work of the lord in us going on because in the natural sense we're not going to have enough endurance and perseverance so what the spirit of god is doing is replacing our lack with god's plenty it's the lord himself coming in right and increasing it's a possession so blessed is the man who perseveres under trial for once he has been approved notice the thought of God, and this is not the only place, there's others that bring this out, this thing of approved or passing the test, it can be translated. It, uh, we see then the wisdom of God in allowing his people, directing his people, instructing his people, um, leading us through the valley of the shadow of death so that we will learn to fear no evil. But we'll also learn that his rod and his staff, that he's with us and his rod and staff comfort us. But you don't learn that by not going through a valley, especially a valley so severe as the shadow of death type valley. Right? Paul learned by facing death, and he talks about it in Corinthians and other places, he learned to never trust himself. That's what he says. But to entrust himself to God. To not ever trust himself. And that's what he says about it. You know, when we came into this, a this Asian area here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we were beside ourselves. Basically had given up all hope of living. Not given up any hope towards God, but all hope of living. He knew that the sentence of death was upon them. But he survived it, and he learned through that process, he says this, to not trust in myself, or not trust in ourselves. He uses the plural. So there's others going through it with him. Again, this is not a minor comment. I'm identifying process. That's what I'm doing. I'm identifying a process. And it's a God process. And readiness is on the other side of the processes, plural. There is no readiness by hunkering down and surviving alone. There is a readiness by an inward work of the Spirit that takes us through the valley of the shadow of death and other such processes so that we will learn of him and we will learn this side of the millennium while it's still possible to learn how to reign with him. 
because he is not going to have an untried, an untested vessel reigning with him. In fact, I could say it stronger than that. So what everybody goes through them, but not everybody goes on far enough in the Lord or deep enough to go through the more severe test. What are you saying, Terry? Are you telling us that the deeper we go into Christ, the further we go on with the Lord, the more severe the trials and tests? Yes. That's exactly the case, and it will be the case. I mean, man, guys, um, in this day and age where success is measured by everything but the Spirit of God possessing us, right? That's pretty much how things are looked at. Um, uh, success is in a human form. Basically, it's numbers or it's whatever, you know. Uh, there's little appreciation for God's form of success that you have learned endurance and you've learned perseverance in the hour of trial. And that's what it's called there in Revelation. It's coming up on the whole world. And though they're not appointed to God's wrath, guys, I'm going to tell you, God's not going to pour out his wrath upon his people during the tribulation. He's going to do that mostly around the kingdom of the beast. That's where most of it will be. Not all of it, but most of it. But he will not protect us from murderers. He never has before to any large degree. Occasionally in the Bible he does that, but most of the time men, they're just saying mankind, they can fight us, they can resist us, they can kill us. Right? Right? So I just want to say that to us. There's no promise in the scriptures that's saying God's protecting us from everything that man can do. In fact, the opposite. What can man do? Don't fear him who can kill the body. Right? They can. Fear him who can kill both body and soul, cast the soul into hell, right? So anyway, I know this is a great, wonderful hallelujah message. <laughs> But it's the, it really is uh, necessary in the times we're living in, I believe, to understand the severity of what's been going on and answers to what we're going through now and what we're going to go through. However, in the wisdom of God, he has arranged for our process. But I guarantee you, let me say this again. If we're going to go all the way, then the, the processes get more and more severe because of that desire, which is a God desire, to be fully His. So let us not shrink back from that. This should be, right? This should be unto Him. We should be unto Him more than anything else. So anyway, James says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive, I want to focus in upon this, the crown of life. Now, I want to show you just a few instances where the crown of life is talked about in the scriptures, but always, always as a result of going through. Whenever you see this talked about, the crown, you will receive the crown of life. It's because you've just been through some, <laughs> some things, right? Rough, tough stuff. That's what's being said here. The crown of life is given after they've been approved, after they've gone through and shown perseverance under trial. But once he has been approved, once he has been approved, that means there's a time to it, the trial has a length to it, according to how long before we are proven and approved, tested, and proven by that test that we're going to stay and stand. And the promise of God is the crown of life. In other words, let's say it this way. Life of God increases dramatically in us if we understand the trying of our faith being more precious than gold. We understand the beauty of what this tribulation means. We would want it. <laughs> Not fear it. Seriously, that's not a 
sadistic thing to say. It's the truth. We would pray that we can stand in the time. We would pray rightly, not escape it in the way of, I don't need this. I'm going to tell you, I need the tribulation for the Lord to finish his process in me. I recognize it. Can you? Just asking. So then the Lord has been very clear with me anyway, going way back. He's like, you're going through it. He said, and here's what he said to me. I'll just tell you. He said, I, he said, I didn't make you ready as a voice to not have you here during the time. Think about that for yourself. He's not filling us with life so that we can't shine in the great darkness. The best vessel he's ever had on this earth will be that bridal vessel that's here all the way to the coming of the Lord before she gets fully ready. That's the best vessel he's ever had. He's not getting rid of that vessel when it's most needed. <laughs> if there's ever been a time there'll need to be the light of Christ, it'll be during that time frame. Right? I'm just trying to express God's heart in this. If we can see it through his wisdom, through his eyes, so to speak, then we can appreciate the time we're living in. Guys, what many generations have wanted, including the tribulation. The early church didn't have a rapture theory. <laughs> they had a different theory. They thought they were in the tri <laughs> They thought that the Lord was coming in their time because they were going through such tribulation. And so they were actually being told by the prophets and the apostles who were absolutely right. If you'll make yourself ready, the Lord's coming. It meant all this stuff. They were geared that way. They didn't have an escapist mentality. Escape what? The Roman Empire was all around them. <laughs> you got to laugh about it. I'm like, just think about it, guys. They're trapped in it. They don't have doctrines that say, oh, man, we're getting out of it, this. They're like, are you kidding? <laughs> Look around. <laughs> we're being hunted. Right? Anyway, I, I'm sorry to laugh about it. For me, it's kind of funny. It's just such a different mentality, sorry, than Western culture Christianity has fed us, which is the path of least resistance. And God disagrees. How many know God disagrees with the path of least resistance? I think he knows us way better than I know myself anyway. I think he understands, Terry, your propensity in good times is to slack off. What do you think, Renee? <laughs> what do you think? And so, I mean, you don't have to raise your hand, but just think about this. How many times has battle, you know, and I, and I, I get this from ministers, <laughs> sorry, but I talked to them on the phone. I won't call their names. You know them, and they're like, Terry, I mean, we're on the front lines, Terry, they'll tell me. Then they'll say, but what we don't understand is why there's so much battle. <laughs> Did you listen to what you just said? <laughs> Last time I knew anything, of being on the front lines, that means where the bullets are going by, you know, and the bombs are blowing, right? So to be, if that's true, so to speak, that's not a pride thing, and it's real, if it's real and there's a front lines and we're, we should be on it, all of us, all God's people, if we're on the front lines, then there's going to be constant, pretty much constant battle because the front lines is where the contact with the enemy is, right? And they can see you and they're trying to kill you. So, you know, very comforting. <laughs> so, so that's the front lines. There's not this peacefulness that these people will talk to me about on the front lines. I mean, I, and I hold back my humor because when I'm talking to them, I want to say, have you ever considered retreating? Because <laughs> if you're on the front lines and you're in battle, that's a good thing. But if you're, on the, if you're, you're only in the front lines in your mind if you're not in battle. If it's peaceful where you're at, you're not on the front lines. Right? Isn't that just militarily true? Don't you think, guys? So anyway... <clears throat> Maybe I shouldn't have said all that, but I did. <laughs> so, so he will receive the crown of life who perseveres under trial. Right? So I want us just to see that again, the crown of life. 
which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And the promise of those who, and those who love him has gone through and proven that love through trial, through test, through tribulation. Love is proven that way, right? Love in marriage, it gets proven. If it's love, and uh, when there's difficulties in marriage, which I know there's none of you guys going through difficulties in your marriages, but if you were, if that ever happened, of course, I know y'all are perfect and it doesn't, right? So I'm playing. Uh, but what is, that, what is that trying times in marriage meant to do? To strengthen the relationship with God and one another. That's what it's meant to do, right? That's God's work in it. The devil is after division. But God's work is union, right? And he achieves that by the storms, by the battles, by the conflicts. Sometimes it can be, I agree, sometimes it can be a little bit, using this word, tricky as to know what to pray against and what to welcome. And I find God really in that dilemma, liking it. <laughs> and, and I'm not saying that. I'm saying for him, you know what it does? It makes me trust him more. Don't lean to your own understanding in this, Terry. Yeah, how many times have you been wrong, Terry? <laughs> About as many times as I have thought a thought. That's how many. <laughs> oh, well. So here James establishes, and it's many other places, but what you will then see, let's read the Romans 5. I, I really like that passage. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in, in hope of the glory of God. Again, Isaiah 60 is very emphatic that in the darkness of the end, the glory of the Lord is going to rise in his people. I can tell you what Isaiah 60 doesn't say. In the darkness of the times, God's going to get his people out. The opposite is said. In the darkness of the times, God is going to arise in his people. The testimony of the Bible itself points to that over and over again, right? I will be greater in you than what's in the world. God proves himself to my heart and your heart relationally that he can be trusted, that he's mighty to save and deliver, knows what he's doing. The hairs of our head are numbered. And if he takes note of the sparrow, he's sure got his eyes upon us, right? So those things are all meant to dispel improper fear while maintaining the fear of God primarily, a fear that causes us to cling to him, run to him, welcome him, not a fear that's shamed, but a fear that we've learned and reverence as to who he is in his person. A reverential fear. He is great. And he's our God. Right? So let's go on. Not only this, but we've also exult in our tribulations. Let's just stop there for a second. We exult in our tribulations. They believed, rightly so, that the Lord was coming in their time. But they believed this as well. That's why they could believe this clearly and be right. And they were right. They believed that it was a matter of readiness. That's what Jesus had said. They knew it, the apostles and prophets. And they knew that if the people were willing to be made ready, the Lord would come. That was his promise. Let me say, the promise of God is to come when there's a bride made ready. You see it scream, screaming at us everywhere in the New Testament. The promise of his coming is according to readiness. Right? Hello? 
That's Matthew. That's what's said about the ten virgins, the five who were ready, the others who were not. They had plenty of oil. So you're, you see the principle that Jesus lays out consistently, that it's all a matter of a ready vessel unto a marriage, and thus the Lord as the bridegroom comes for the bride. It's the principle of this. But the bride being made ready includes tribulation. Tribulations, plural, and for us. And it was always what they believed in the New Testament because they, guys, the Lord could have returned in the New Testament and everything been fulfilled. We had the Roman Empire. We had an Antichrist in Nero and others. All of that could have been remedied quickly if the people had made themselves ready and the final things would have been engaged then. It was meant to be. And we would have skipped 2,000 years of a backslidden condition in the people of God. The Lord wanted to return. God the Father wanted him to return. But this is the issue of readiness. This is why I'm pointing to it. So guys, let me hit it again. There's no readiness of the bride without the tribulation. I'm going to tell you that straight up. There is no readiness. God the Father himself, the Bible will back it up, but I, you guys know the story. God the Father himself told me that the tribulation period is the great tribulation period. It's called the great tribulation. With, with that adjective in front of tribulation, the great. Tribulation, the great one, before or behind. It's called that because of its finality in the readying of the bridal vessel. It's called that for many other reasons as to God's judgments and wrath upon the world. But let's look at the positive side. It's in that time frame that he has finally what he has wanted. And isn't that what this is really about? Us becoming that to him? I'm not there yet. I recognize that. Simple. What will help me to be made ready? This process. All of it. That's something to exalt in, to rejoice in this moment, that we're in such a moment. That's the way I look at it. So uh, we exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulations brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character. This is that provenness again, right? It's not that God doesn't know what's in us. I think it's more that we don't. <laughs> don't you think sometimes, guys? It's, you know, tribulation has a way of highlighting what's the Lord and what's not. <laughs> don't you think? Anyway, so proven character and proven character, hope, and does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so, as we look at, again, sequence, you can see it here in this passage and others, so I'm going to look at a few others. So, here in uh, first or Second Peter chapter 2, I talked about, let's look at it here for a moment. <clears throat> Verse 4, Second Peter chapter 1. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises in order that by them you might become partakers. Now I want to just say this to you guys. He's focusing on not just proven character now. He's talking about being partakers of the divine nature. That means having God dwell and living us. See, there's the divine nature, which is the Spirit of God living in us, Christ living in us, God the Father living in us, the triune God, His nature being in us. So see, see, there's a focus as to what God's after that I want us to see in all this. Proven character, there's a crown of life, the other side of it, only though. Then how Peter's introducing partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corrupt, corruption that is in the world by lust. Now, for this very reason. Now, again, guys, remember who's writing this and when. 
This is a belligerent time towards Christians when this is being written. There's Christians already being hunted, murdered. I mean, once Nero makes being a Christian uh, against the state a threat to his deity, then uh, throughout the Roman Empire, uh, Christians were going to have major issues. Not all of them died, but some did. Killed by people, right? Murdered. All kinds of stuff going on. But what is God after in all this? Is he just like seeing his kids get killed? I guarantee you, those who kill his children aren't going to like the consequences of their actions if they don't make that right with the Lord. It will be great judgment, great wrath. God will defend his own. And, and he has a real unique way of doing it <laughs> on multiple levels, temporal and eternal. Both come into play. So it's one thing to say he's going to kill them. It's another thing, though, but he's going to cast them into hell and torment them. That's part of it. So uh, they don't get off scot-free for killing his kids, right? They never do. All right, so let's go on. Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence. I can't frame the importance for this very reason. What is he out to say? What are the apostles and prophets teaching the church in that day? They're teaching them the significance of process and understanding it. These scriptures are explaining the processes of God to us. And that, guys, if we're going to go all the way, please hear, I'm reiterating this. I'm out too many times, maybe, Ben. If we're going to go all the way with God, this is what's going to happen. We happen to be in the time we were in, are in now, but it was happening with them in this time. And it happened to many since that time. Right? You look back through the history of what's even what's called saints. Look at what they went through. They weren't treated nicely. You know that? <laughs> So uh, in this world, Jesus was emphatic, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. We can expect what we can expect. Don't go looking for it, but let's not be shocked by it. And let's particularly not be ignorant of the processes of God and how he utilizes everything in order to perfect us as a bride. That, who is going, that bride who is going to reign with him has to be perfected, Right? And so applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, I'm running through these. In your moral excellence, knowledge. That would be the knowledge of God, though. And in your knowledge, self-control, fruit of the Spirit. In your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. Love for God is talking about there. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, look at the things being said here. <laughs> per perseverance, self-control. Uh, guys, it's not what the church in modern times wants to talk about in Western culture. It's not what is uh, part of the preparation for God's people to have our own understanding rewired to understand how God works and to recognize the process, appreciate the process, and not shrink back from it, right? He who lacks these qualities is blind, short-sighted, like Laodicea, by the way. That's one of the implications of Laodicea. Don't you know you're blind? Well, they didn't, <laughs> right? Short-sighted. Think of that word, short-sighted. Is that not a human trait? We can't see what's in store long-term in this process. We only see the pain. <laughs> That's short-sighted, right? 
But what is God achieving in the pain? What is God doing? He's building endurance and perseverance. Trust in Him beyond ourselves. So short-sightedness is a real problem, don't y'all think, guys? It's, it's easy for me to get my eyes only on this thing that's happening right now and not see where God is taking this if I go with Him. That's just an encouragement that I'm trying to share with each and all, including myself. Again, the moment is going to cause us or try to cause us to be short-sighted. Knowing, again, why is such a message? Knowing how God works, His ways, the principles of God, will cause us not to get bogged down in the moment and see the outcome, see the consequences, see what God is after. That's why I'm saying what I'm saying. Then we're not angry, we're not implicating, we're not finger pointing at God. Why are, that's an implication, why is an implication. It's what God is doing is the issue, and that's where I want to look, don't you? I want to see beyond this, these things that are absolutely in the highway. It's not that they're not there. They absolutely are there, right? Because people are like, oh, I don't even pay attention to it. Yeah, yeah. Then you'll keep going through it till you do. <laughs> because the Lord does want you to recognize like, that this is real, but it's real unto a purpose, and then its purpose ends and I achieve this. Anyway, so see, see the principle is what I want us to see. Why the tribulation? Why? Why is it important? It's important for all these reasons and more. If the smaller tribulations are important, I guarantee you the big one is of ultimate importance for the bride. Revelation 19. He who has, he who lacks these qualities versus he who has these qualities. And these qualities have come out of trials and tests. They've been formed and proven in that fire. Forged in us, the Spirit of God. Christ in us, forged in the fire. Right? So no, don't skip verse 10, the importance of verse 10 in this. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent. Notice that, Ben. That's an incredible statement, isn't it? All the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. This is in context with everything he's been saying in the process. Staying in the process. Appreciating the process. Recognizing God's intent in the process. That will comfort us. And be, in and of itself, the Lord being that in us, a deliverance from these things that would want to trip us up, cause confusion, bring fear. So he's saying, recognize all that's happening and recognize that this is going to make your calling certain. There's great benefit to God's processes. Don't you agree? Spiritually speaking. <clears throat> so, and he ends this verse 10 with this. Make certain about his calling and his choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. That's amazing, isn't it? Perseverance being learned, endurance being learned. The processes of God will teach us to depend upon Him, to allow Him to have His way. And when we allow Him to have His way rather than our own, when we allow Him to do His work, when we allow His processes to have their full consequences according to His will, you're not going to stumble. Which some don't even believe is possible. Well, you got to sin, do you? You don't. You do before you're a believer, but once Christ comes in, that's not true. It's not a matter of us being perfect. It's a matter of who's perfect inside of us. And if he lives and I don't, problem solved. Isn't that true? It's a simple deduction. I totally agree. You cannot live without sinning. You cannot. Christ has proven he can. And it becomes a matter of who lives. 
So Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Problem solved. But it's who we depend on anyway. Anyway, that's just a whatever. <laughs> I don't know what that was, Ben. Whatever it was, but it's, it's a point, though, that what the scriptures are saying to us is there's a consequence of this. And, it, and what it leads to in these passages is God, it's called godly living. It's called moral excellence. And in the immorality of our day, when things are being, you know, acting like it's not a big deal, which God disagrees, we disagree as well. Uh, moral excellence, godly living, godly character, proven character, that's important to God, whether it's important to what's called the church or not. But for God's people, it needs to be important to see that's the work of God with us. Again, you know, guys, I know that can take this just individually, and it is individually. But think about it corporately, and God works corporately to bring us into that kind of unity in the faith. Now, wouldn't you agree with me that's an incredible work, and it's a very necessary work? What if God, no matter how big or small the group is, could bring us into that place of a corporate unity and a bond of peace with God and thus with the family of God, that's how it works, if he can bring us into that, and he wants to, and establish that within a corporate people to where we literally are all on the same page as to what God's processes are meant to bring about, the consequence is God is looking to work us unto through this process through these trials through these tests if we can see that corporately and the bring again not being disjointed not being members unconnected but instead being one in that life one in that knowledge of the lord one in understanding his ways and go on and on and on with that one that he's going to have he's going to have exactly what the bible describes here he's going to have a vessel that's a ready vessel. But that's got to become corporate. It matters, right? It matters where our hearts are with the Lord. That matters. You know, so anyway, let me look at Revelation here just a little bit, and then I'll uh, close. I wanted to share something else. So <clears throat> here in Revelation uh, chapter 2 and 3, really, um, I wanted to get back to this one point I was making about the crown of life real quick to see it. The crown of life is promised to those who are going through tribulation. And I want us to see that. So chapter 2 of Revelation, you know, the church at Smyrna. But anyway, verse 10, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold the devil is to is going to cast some of you into prison and you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days be faithful unto death and i will give you the crown of life one other passage i hope this is uh encouraging us not discouraging us you know so this is revelation chapter 3 starting with verse 10 in chapter 3 though because you have kept the word of my perseverance. Notice that, because you've kept, notice that the word of my perseverance, Sam, that's a unique way of saying it, isn't it? Don't you think? And it's interesting, you know, the, the Greek word for word there is logos, or a form of it, not rhema. In other places, it's actually like when looking at some of the epistles, they're talking about um, the word as the rhema, spoken. What God is speaking, whereas this is more, can be what God has spoken as well, but also from the scriptures. So both are in play. The voice of God, however, in the scriptures, the voice of God to us, there should be a beautiful combination in that, right? Don't you think, guys? So I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. So they're being tested, but that's being tested by God. But there's a godly test for the wicked that is not going to be upon the righteous. 
The righteous test will produce beauty. The test of God for the wicked, if it doesn't produce salvation, it's going to produce destruction. That is not the lot of God's people, nor is it the will of God for God's people. But I will say this, during this final time, the will of God has to get expressed in wrath, which God said this way, he is who he is. He doesn't go there quickly. So if he's going to go to wrath, it's because of there's a people deserving in the world of that wrath. In fact, you can see it by the bold judgments being the, with this, the wrath of God, the final will be poured out. You can see there's judgments before that level of wrath that should and does, in some cases, give people a chance to repent and turn to the Lord, right? And if they do that, they won't undergo the bold judgments of wrath. So God's always at work, and he's working in his kindness to lead people to repentance. Times kindness is not enough, and so judgment becomes a necessary tool to sober and awaken people, right? So wait, let, wait, let me go on. Verse 11, I'm coming quickly. Notice this. I, that's, I, I, just, I want to just suggest something very straightforward, though. You go back and look at this, and not just this in some of the epistles, how the coming of the Lord is tied directly to perseverance, to endurance. The coming of the Lord is tied over and over again in the scriptures to the going through of something. In this case, I'm coming quickly, hold fast. Right? Hold fast what you have in order that no one takes your crown. So there's a crown of life the other side of this, just what he's told the other believers. There's a crown of life the other side of this tribulation, the other side of these tests, the other side of these trials, the other side of the valley of the shadow of death. There's a crown of life. There is an increase of the life of Christ. And the crown sitting on the head should have some meaning. It's a headship battle, particularly Christ being our head corporately or mankind being the head. The natural mind versus the mind of Christ, right? The carnal mind versus the mind of Christ. So there's this battle. Anyway, the promise keeps coming to those going through such things. And right here in the book of Revelation as well, that you're going to receive the crown of life. They're telling these folks here at Philadelphia, hold fast. Hold fast, right? So he who overcomes, verse 12, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. So there's promises, again, of God coming forth. So I want to point out to us something. The beauty of God's process, thus, is the conclusion, is the beauty of God's processes, the reasons for those processes, and they're beautiful, so that he can ready a bride, so that it can be a people who reign with him forever over an ever-expanding kingdom of God in the universe. God's purpose in this is to give. God's purpose in this is to share. God's purpose in this is to bestow, but not upon an immature vessel. That An immature vessel cannot reign. They cannot, and they will not reign with him. That vessel that's going to reign has got to be tried, proven, tested in fire. Go through the valley of the shadow of death. For some, multiple times. And learn of the Lord in it. I hope we can see the beauty and the wisdom of God. And I'm just using a few scriptures. Y'all know there's so many more, guys, because y'all know them. There's so many more scriptures that point to the fact the crown of life is the other side of tribulation. 
And it, if it's personal or corporate, if it's in the past or what we're about to go through, I guarantee you God's purpose in us going through what we're going to go through is readiness and the promise is a crown of life and the promise to the overcomers is reigning with him. So God's after something beautiful and I don't want my fear to cause that which God means for good for me to only see as evil. There's no doubt that <laughs> Joseph's brothers had it Ill, Ill intent. There's no doubt about that, at least some of them. But what God meant to do could only be gotten at through that process of a work in Joseph who now is going to reign with Pharaoh. And so without the process, Joseph remains the Joseph that doesn't have enough wisdom when not to share his dreams. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> you know, you'll be all right if you share that dream with Jacob. But if you share that dream with Reuben or Judah or any of the rest of your brothers, you are in trouble. <laughs> so uh, Joseph was not fit to reign until after he'd had the 14 years. God knew that. Joseph didn't. Right? Do I? I'm ready to reign. I'm not saying that. I don't even believe that about myself. I believe that there's got to be a readying process for there to be someone ready who can go up and meet him in the air at his coming. I'm not worried about the dead in Christ. They're going to go up. <laughs> but I don't want to be one of the dead in Christ. And I don't mean physically dead. <laughs> Do y'all? <laughs> I'd rather have an abundance of the life that is Christ <laughs> and not be considered. I don't want to go up first, Victor. I don't want to be a part of <laughs> being alive and go up with the dead. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound good, does it, brother? <laughs> so anyway, instead, if I can appreciate and kiss the sun right now and recognize his works in this, then uh, he can take us further than we've ever been and make us more prepared and ready as pertains to his desire eternally than uh, we could ever achieve by missing these things. We've got to contemplate that fact. To not do what his plans are is to leave us in a state of not being fully ready. Not being fully ready for a marriage. Not being fully ready for reigning with him. Right? Right? So anyway, I, I, now I want to stop here and I want to share, tie some of this in with, uh, on, on the 22nd of September, which was a Sunday, uh, that night around 9 o'clock or so, it was after 9, I was getting ready to go to bed, stood up, I told Donna good night, and um, an angel appeared in the living room, and so... Um, the angel was in full battle uh, readiness with armor and sword out. I did not know the angel. I'd never seen the angel before. Um, I just knew that the angel was from his, his station, at least right now, is in Washington, D.C. So his message was uh, kind of multiple-fold. Multiple I thought it was important to share, and I'll share it in other places as well. So the message started with this, that we were to, to be prepared to stand and uh, be prepared uh, to resist. He said, uh, in standing, he said, you're always in standing surrounded by conflict or you're not really standing. It's always a battle, it's always a conflict but not only to stand, but to resist. You know, and of course, he's not just talking about the devil. He is, but the devil through whatever, right? Systems of man, including governmental systems or whatever. 
You know, he's very emphatic about the need for God's people in this time to stand. Then he moved quickly to um, the election. Not in talking about who's going to win. That was not God's point. God's point was everybody. The angel was very clear. Everyone needs to vote. Everyone needs to vote. He was emphatic about it. God wants everybody to vote. That's how he said it. God wants it. The reason is, he said, is because God wants to see where the heart and the conscience of the people of this nation truly are by the vote. So he said, you need to pray that the vote results will be the true results. That's what he said. It's, he said, no matter how the vote goes, God wants to see the vote of the people, not something rigged or cheated, but the actual vote of the people, even though God knows. But something is proven in how we vote, right? So it's very important. So he did not say vote for certain so-and-so. He did not say that. The important thing is that we vote according to our conscience. And our conscience will be revealed according to how we vote. So then he moves on beyond that to the fact of you need to pray as well, he said. You need to pray. And he said God's people need to vote this way. He said they need to vote that God will have a land in this land that is a refuge for God's people. That's what he said. He basically said this. I'll put it in my language, but he, he really said it this way. Forget all the other things of division and vote according to what God wants in this land, not the nation, in the land. That this is meant to be, part of it at least, is meant to be a refuge land. And so that's part of God's work. So I asked him then how that tied in with the deluge I was shown. Uh, he did not know the answer because angels only know what they're told, what they're allowed to hear, and that by God or by other angels or whoever, seraphim or cherubim. But so, and when I went to asking a few simple questions of tying that in with what, I've been told, uh, then he can answer it. So Gabriel was sent to answer those questions. And so Gabriel made it emphatically clear that the 22nd marked an historic moment. What I was told in the deluge experiences that before the Republic emerged in the deluge, the darkness of the deluge, there had been a movement prior for its return among people who were working behind the scenes underground to bring forth the Republic. Gabriel told me that the 22nd marked the time of beginning to where those people, whoever they are, underground behind the scenes, will work towards the establishment of the new Republic, which Gabriel said will be established in the darkness of the deluge. So I just wanted to make sure to tie it in, that's why I was questioning the angel who didn't know the answers. And you know, unlike humans, if they don't know the answer, they don't give an answer. <laughs> I think I need to be a little bit more like an angel <laughs> at times. <laughs> to not know is okay, right? I don't know. <laughs> and so when they don't know, they don't talk about it. So I'm saying this to say then, um, the uh, 22nd was before everything that happened over in uh, East Tennessee and Western North Carolina. It was before we found out about the announcement of the, uh, the WHO, World Health Organization, getting the UN to side with them for this massive thing. I don't know how much y'all know about that. You may know everything about it. But 26 governors in this nation have already said they will not obey the UN. Because this is basically everything we've talked about concerning the beast system. And by the way, y'all know this, but I want to point it out. The beast system is on board before, before the horn that comes up among them. The system is already in place. 
It's a Babylonian system. It becomes then, it's a beast system, but it becomes under the control of that one horn, but it's already established. The one horn simply comes up and seizes power and others hand their power to the horn. So anyway, back to this, this whole thing of the World Health Organization that came out whatever day it was, you know, kept it hush-hush in the media in this nation. Basically, guys, we'd lose every right you have, every single one of them. And they turned the whole United States over to the UN. Our president signed off on it. And a hundred and whatever, 193 other nations. Yeah, whatever it was. Supposed to be all of them, but I can't imagine Israel did that. I can't believe Russia would do it. They're at odds. But anyway, whoever all did it, it was the vast majority of the nations. They said everybody. I don't believe that, but we'll see. So anyway, the point is, that happened after the angel said, prepare to stand. So, you know, that was like two or three days later when that all came out about the UN. And so they're moving, of course they're moving, they're moving to make it one world order. That's the whole point of the UN, one world order. And the World Health Organization, which, you know, has tried to do this kind of tactic before, did not have the backing of the UN, and now they do. So I'm saying this to say God didn't send that angel for no reason. We've got to be clear that we're not going to shrink back, cower, or be cowards, but that we will stand in the Lord. We will stand. We will resist the devil. And if you look at the Greek word resist, have anybody looked at that word? That Greek word, it means a hand-to-hand -hand wrestling. <laughs> it's not even long range. <laughs> So I'm saying this, it's going to take God's people then, like some of the governors are, but the people of the states in this nation and in other nations to stand and resist these edicts that are being passed down by the UN that are against our faith, guys. And we know by the scriptures what this means. So I, I just wanted to, to bring that out to us this morning and share. So as we rapidly, and I mean rapidly, things are moving rapidly now, not slowly. And they're, they're gaining great ground with this system. You know, most nations are on board with it. And so I think we need to pray. I'll say this. I think we need to pray what the Lord told me years ago, that those sheep nations that Gabriel mentioned in 2001, would now emerge, that they would have the wisdom to say no and be a sheep nation rather than a goat nation. Don't you think? So anyway, all right, well, I want to pray specific about that and then one other thing. So Lord, we take it before you. We, your people, Lord, again, through all these processes, we, your people, to not fear fear and not be ruled or paralyzed by fear. But instead, Lord, a confidence that you are able to keep what's committed to you and those who are committed to you. If we are meant to live and we're yours, Lord, no one can take our life from us. And if in your will we're to go, I say yes and amen. That's me. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for a divine moment, whatever that moment entails. I ask for every heart here strength in the inner being of God, the continuing readying of us, your people, and your people everywhere across this city, across this county, across this state, across the states that are in this present nation, and other nations throughout the world, that your people stand, having done everything to stand, Ephesians 6, stand therefore, and we stand with the full armor of God.
And one other thing, this is the final thing in coming up. The Lord showed me his hand of healing this morning. He was placing his hand of healing upon various people here. Um, but, it, you know, it was interesting because his hand literally was the hand of, of his blood. So I realized it being shown to me that way that there was an expression of the Lord's right in the blood of the Lamb to heal. It was a counter to activity, both demonic or physical, but a counter in the blood right of the Lamb was being expressed in healing. That's what he was showing me. So anyway, if you need healing, just stand up right where you're at. Um, and I would just want to pray for and with you for God's healing on your bodies. Lord, what you showed me was dealing with the blood, your blood, which is not usually how you show it, but this time you did. Whatever all that means, I'm asking this according to Revelation 12, using this verse just a little bit different. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. I'm asking the blood of the lamb to overcome right now with these, your people standing, these physical things that are attacking them, have been attacking them, fighting against their body and their system. Heal that your blood, Lord, now heal your servants, your people. Thus, by your blood, break the power of the enemy. Break the purpose of the enemy, his intent, his desires. And let your purpose only, Lord, be established in your people. Let your healing, Lord, heal and restore where damage has been done. So not only heal, but I'm asking for divine wholeness. I'm asking for divine health. I'm asking for the exercising of your divine authority because of your blood over all that the enemy has planned and purposed outside of the will of God against your people right now. Heal, Lord. Restore divine health divine wholeness by your authority and in your authority the name that's above every name we pray now Lord in the name of Jesus Lord encouragement as well to your people who are standing in this battle Lord easy at times in the battle to be discouraged let great encouragement in the inner man be in your people right now, Lord. In fact, Holy Spirit, you are the encourager. And be in your people right now. Great encouragement. Great encouragement. And let there be, Lord, a divine joy that's from you. In the inner man, joy, I ask in Jesus' name. Lay me on, guys.